So this is There's Lead in the Water, Environmental Racism and Sexual Reproductive Justice. Um, with I'm sure a lot of the conversations that maybe you've taken part in or some of the topics that we've heard so far during the conference, um, a lot of these topics are difficult to hear about, um, difficult to talk about. So this is a content warning. There is multiple ways in which I'm sure we have, or maybe this is the first presentation for you personally, where we are gonna be talking about uh, state violence. So we're going to move, well, actually, before we do, I wanna show what we have here. So this is our title slide. I have a theme. The theme is meant to be a garden. And the image that I have here is from a protest that took place um, no less than three years ago. Um, if folks are familiar with the MTV Music Awards, um, currently, and I always have been, meaning that I'm born in Newark, New Jersey, uh, the MTV Music Awards decided to host their event in Newark, New Jersey. And this happened to come at a time where in this presentation, we'll talk more about it, um, the community organized to protest uh, lead contamination in our drinking water and the water that we bathe in. So this is an image of community members outside of the event space uh, where the MTV Music Awards were happening. Okay, we're gonna move to the next. This is a bit of our agenda. None of this actually means anything. It is just how I decided to organize it based off of the pictures. Um, but by plant the seeds, I mean, we're going to be defining our terms. Um, also in my introduction, I will be talking a bit more about this, but I did write in the description of this workshop that although I'm including resources and sources, um, that I hope that part of this conversation is also pulling apart this um, very heady academic gatekeeping that we do of what information is valid, who is valid in telling a story. So a lot of what we're going to hear about during this conversation or during this talk is also going to be based off of lived experience. So um, that we're gonna be defining terms in the garden tour, we're going to be getting to know a bit about uh, the community that I grew up in or loved ones have grown up in, communities that may resonate or echo with you. And in our harvesting, we're going to be looking at how it's possible for us to take the places that we're in, in our the work that we're choosing um, and how to take what we're learning and carry that into the places that we work. Okay, we're gonna move into the next. The first part is the seeds. So what are we talking about? And the image is coming up next. We could move to the next. Is a very blurry picture of me. So we're gonna go back and I'm gonna talk about myself uh, for a brief moment. So I am the person wearing the pink floral crown. This is a picture that's taken in Ecuador. I am in between my cousin and my brother, which are older than me. I'm wearing a white dress with some different color, uh, sort of like a crisscross pattern. And my, and I see in the chat, the crown is so pretty. Thank you. So, so pretty. I am choosing this picture to introduce myself because there is a lot I can say in terms of how I ended up doing this presentation. I've been doing sex education for more than 10 years. I am born and raised in Newark, New Jersey, but I am also the child of immigrants. And so I feel that I live in more than one place at one time. And the experiences that I carry with me in the work that I do also come from the experiences that I've grown up around, um, the experiences that I've witnessed my parents having to um, struggle with, face, um, and really still do. And so just 
to name besides all of those um, identifiers. Some of the things that I carry with me is that I also have privilege in that I've graduated from college. I have privilege in having light skin. I have pretty privilege. I have English speaking privilege. Um, I have cis passing privilege. So I have all of these things, um, all to say that the information that I'm going to be sharing um, very likely has been talked about much longer uh, by Black Femmes, um, by Indigenous community. And I have just been fortunate enough to have had my privilege get me to a place where I'm able to talk to you all today. With that, I want to stop sharing screen so we can see each other if we have our cameras on. And I want to just get to know who we have here. So anyone who's moved, and I understand if there's some JV, you're muted. That was golden too. So <laughs> while we all can see each other, I was asking for anyone that would like to. Um, I just want to see if people want to share who they are, why they're here, where they're coming from, um, whether you want to share it in the chat and I can share it out loud, or if folks want to unmute themselves. If you try to unmute yourself and you can't, please let me know in the chat and I will fix it. Hello, my name is Gia. She and they are my pronouns. It's nice to meet everybody. I'm excited to hear what you have to offer. Thank you, Gia. I also see in the chat, uh, Josie from Bloomington, Indiana, Indiana, here because I care about others and always learning more with um, less than and a three, so a heart. Anyone else, if anything, if we're not sharing what brought us to this specific time together, um, maybe just anything that's coming up so far or when we saw the title of this uh, workshop, what came up for you? I'll introduce myself. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Christian. I'm from the island of Guam, or U.S. territory of the United States in the Pacific Ocean. And what brought me here is because um, the session is about lead in the water. And right now, um, Guam is like under threat by the U.S. military because they decided to pick um, our aquifer, the location where our aquifer is, our main aquifer for the island, for a shooting range. And in their environmental impact statement, they said like that's the worst location to pick due to the material that the bullets are made out of to seep into our aquifer. Yet they are still going ahead on that. And yeah, so I just want to learn more about that and what other people's thoughts are on like lead in the water. Oh, thank you for coming, Christian. I do see that folks are also sharing in the chat. Um, the most recent one I can see is Nathalie from Washington Heights. And I'm gonna scroll up so that I can continue to read it. Born to Dominican parents, I'm here because I don't know much about reproductive justice and its connection to climate justice. Hey folks, I'm Chris, a black, queer, disabled, Puerto Rican slash Cuban. I use they them pronouns and I'm excited because I feel that not enough folks are talking about intersections of climate and reproductive justice, appreciate this and everyone in it. Cool. Can so I? folks, oh yes, someone is unmuting. Hi everyone, I'm Yasmin, I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm in Lenape territory, also known as New York City. Um, and I am really interested because my everyday work actually works with nuclear weapons and radiation exposure. And that has a very significant interplay um, with reproductive justice. And so really interested to learn about other, other interplays and intersections of reproductive justice with both militarism and the environment and climate. So thank you for hosting this, JV. Thank you. Um, I'm just gonna read one more from the chat. 
Uh, Julia is from New Jersey. I'm here because I care deeply about reproductive justice and I'm currently in training to become a birth doula. That always brings a smile to my face and want to further understand its intersections with environmental justice. Awesome. Um, if we didn't get a chance to share, I invite people to interact with uh, reaction icons, or I'm not sure how to call it actually, anything that's coming up while I'm sharing information. I will keep talking forever if I can, so I'm gonna get into the content. So we're gonna come back to our slide. Thank you everybody for sharing. All right, so we're gonna move and we are going to define environmental racism. So this is a term that became new to me. Um, I mentioned that I've been doing sex ed for more than 10 years. Um, I'm going to get into how that started, um, but I, in wanting to continue to work in community, also ended up working for uh, an organization called Ironbound Community Corporation, um, a very small place where I learned about the history of environmental racism um, taking place for my neighbors um, and within the community that I live in. So we have a definition up here, uh, environmental racism, and I'll read it out loud. Environmental racism, is a type of racism perpetuated by the disproportionate location of environmental hazards near economically and socially disadvantaged areas. So although I have a definition, although I'm sure it's customary that when we're sharing information, we have the pop-in sources, we have whatever is most trusted um, for people to really get the point. Um, what I do wanna continue to share is that this is uh, rooted in white supremacy for us to value one thing over another. Um, in my experience, just getting to this conversation, um, I see myself as one of the few sex educators that I've seen um, at conferences. So conferences that are very expensive um, conferences where a majority of the people doing sex education um, are white. And I've often been asked, what gives me the right to be here? So when I see this definition, something that comes up for me in a way that I understand environmental racism, um, and this may resonate with folks as well, is that factories um, and pollution, sites of pollution and harm, are often saturated, um, are in huge numbers in communities of color. And so if you are in a zip code that happens to be more affluent, that has more money, it's very likely that you will have much less factories. Um, so Newark wise, um, there has been a fight against a garbage incinerator who produces um, toxic waste into the air of all aged people who already have a 25% asthma rate uh, as soon as you're born in Newark. There have been two other incinerators that are have been fought, are currently being fought. Um, if we didn't have an environmental justice movement, uh, we would likely have four incinerators within a already dense community um, that is known to be a predominantly uh, black and brown city. So that is my interpretation of when I see this definition. We're gonna move to the next slide. Reproductive justice. So how do these tie together? I mentioned that I've been doing sex ed for a long, long time, um, but some things never really occurred to me or intersected how a lot of people have been saying um, until I realized no one is talking about this, why? Um, one of those things I will just quickly mention because we are working from a language justice lens as well is that I, my first language is Spanish. Um, the language that I'm learning is Quechua. 
um, native to the Andes. And I have been doing sex education for so long, but only in the last few years have I pieced together that it is really hard to do sex ed in Spanish with limited resources, and that sex ed in Spanish simply was not happening in my community and lots of other communities. So that is something um, dear to me. And also um, that sex education for people with intellectual and or developmental disability also doesn't really exist. Um, it may happen in small spaces, but um, really is something that's incredibly violent and harmful. So the definition that we're going to be using for reproductive justice um, is the one that I am most comfy with. Sister Song defines reproductive justice as the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, have children, not have children, and parent the children uh, we have in a safe, in safe and sustainable communities. Pardon the pause, sometimes I look at the chat. So with this definition, I just want us to take this with us um, because when we think of reproductive justice, a lot of times what we may imagine uh, may be people we may identify as women. Um, but in this definition, this is really anybody, someone with the right to be safe in their community. Um, so this does bring in a lot of intersecting issues. How does someone live in a community, um, grow up safely? The concept that I bring into conversations in sex education is that we are often talked about, um, we often, or rather when I talk about sex education, what I hope to talk about is that we're talking about how we feel in our bodies. Um, so with this definition, whether someone has children or doesn't have children, the impacts of environmental racism impact people and impact community and um, are even overlooked when we think about or see the displacement that happens in community as well. So we're going to be moving to the next slide. So the sex education background, Masakane Center um, is a completely youth-driven, donation-run, grassroots collective um, that trains people in Newark um, on becoming sex educators. And the sex education happens for free in lots of locations um, for young people, for people um, experiencing um, substance dependency recovery um, for adults. And so this is my background. I um, describe my entering sex education as not knowing or not having the spirit to know what I wanted to do in community college. And so when someone asked me if I ever wanted to talk about sex education, it was my first time realizing that that was an option. So uh, what we have here is the logo for Masakane. Uh, Masakane is a Kauso word, meaning let's build ourselves for ourselves together. And we'll move into a next slide. A bit more on Masakane. Um, so Masakane, right now is um, young people, whether they're high school or college aged people, graduate level, um, that are taking on workshops now virtually, but have done so for about 15 years now, for a very long time. Uh, and some of the guiding principles, something that the organization and board members, including myself, continue to come back to, is how to provide sex positive, pleasure focused sexual health education um, because everyone deserves the opportunity to access these tools as a means of pro-queer, anti-racist and pro-trans liberation. So constantly coming back to how can this be better? Um, so this is a space, um, Masakani is a space that gives me life um, because I do have to get paid um, in the world that we live in. And so this isn't paid work, but it feels like good work. Um, so we'll move to the next slide. Uh, just a bit on Masakane in the Newark community. The image that we have on the left is of a black child uh, with 
military people with weapons. And this is an image from the 1967 rebellion in Newark. The same issues that we talk about and experience now of police violence, of displacement, even by universities and hospitals, um, are the same reasons why the 1967 rebellion started in Newark. And because of the 1967 uh, rebellion in Newark, there was white flight. And in my personal takeaway, there has never really been a recovery since then. In terms of the business, in terms of um, how people see Newark, but what does come from Newark is a lot of community care, Masakane being one of those places. So in 2003, when Masakane began, this is actually um, the year and the summer after a young black lesbian, Sakia Gunn, was coming home from New York uh, because we are a port city surrounded by a train station um, ports. Actually, uh, there's an airport as well. Sakia Gunn was coming home from New York, uh, was catcalled by uh, male identified people and was murdered um, at the busiest intersection at night in Newark. So this is less than one mile away from an art gallery space um, that Masakane now does our intern training, our educator training. We're gonna move forward. And I can't see it, but I know what I wrote. Give me one moment. Oh, whitewashed pink pussy hat feminism is not it, neither is whitewashed environmentalism. So the image that we have here is of the pink pussy hat protest. Um, but I chose this image because a lot of the conversations in white feminism um, are not inclusive or include the lived experiences of probably people who couldn't make it to this march or who feel as though and I appreciate um, in the chat just bringing back uh, Sister Song as a collective that began because there uh, was no amplification of the voices of uh, Black and Brown femmes. Uh, and so with environmentalism, we see a connection in hearing that a tote bag and recycling are the things that's going to get us out of this uh, mess that we're in, to, so to say. But we're going to look at communities like a lot of the communities that we come from who are bearing the brunt of environmental racism and aren't really making headlines about the experiences. We're going to move to the next. So I don't know if this is dated, but at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a meme that started by this person, Thomas, um, on Twitter. Wow, Earth is recovering. Air pollution is slowing down. Water pollution is clearing up. Natural wildlife returning home. Coronavirus is Earth's vaccine. We are the virus. Uh, so when seeing this, there is conversation amongst people where there was tons of pictures of like water becoming clearer. Um, then it became, as memes do, an evolution to show that that's a joke, um, but I just wanted to start with this place. A person who can come from a perspective of believing that a pandemic um, could benefit the world is not conscious of the actual damage that continues to happen uh, to native communities, um, is not conscious of the fear that people who continued and have never stopped working during the pandemic have to experience, or um, the anxiety that comes with not being able to access healthcare even before this pandemic. So we're going to move to the next. Here we have one of the evolutions of this meme. Birds are returning to skate parks, nature is healing. This is one of the ones that I liked the most. It's a, an image, a four panel image of different small birds on uh, what are they called, skate deck, kind of these finger skateboards. Um, 
My favorite condensed information has actually come from Instagram on this. Uh, 10%. Uh, the world's richest 10% produce half of global carbon emissions, while the poorest half contribute only 10%. Um, source this from subversive thread. Subversive thread. We're going to move to the next. 97% of waste produced in the United States is corporate waste. So in our conversation on what is environmental racism, and I see tech decks are throwbacks, uh, in our just defining what is environmental racism, we see that there is an ongoing practice of redlining. So pushing community members into spaces, um, but further into that conversation, how these spaces are especially uh, harmful for people to live in. So we're going to move to the next slide. This is where we start talking about what does Newark look like? Uh, what does it mean to be pushed into a space um, that is dangerous to live in, um, otherwise known as a sacrifice zone? I'm going to take a look at our first slide in this section. This is an image of my buddy, Chris. Chris is wearing beaded necklaces. Chris has braids in their hair and a mask. And they're also holding up a printed image of a community action for climate justice. The information I have here is that black communities are exposed to 56% more pollution than is caused by their consumption. And so if we bring it back to Thomas on their Twitter post, um, to think that nature is healing because people weren't maybe contributing less to transportation or maybe to producing waste um, for communities like the community that Chris uh, grew up in and that Chris now works in is a community that uh, having a tote bag and recycling bottles is not going to um, not going to end up in, in saving people essentially. We're going to move to the next. In Newark, I mentioned that one in four people born in Newark are born with asthma. The image that we have on the left is from the 60s. It is one of the wards of Newark, um, the East Ward, the Ironbound. The main street has lots of restaurants, um, different shops. There's festivals that happen on this street. Um, and it is perceived or known to be made up of a lot of Portuguese and Spanish people. Um, but further down the street, when there are less or actually no businesses, there's no doctor's offices, um, there's no libraries, um, there is definitely still a school, there is a garbage incinerator. Um, and so this is one of the spaces that even in this image, even when people that do know of this community of Newark, the Ironbound, um, don't actually know. So it's a community that's facing a lot of environmental impact um, and isn't even really known by the Newark community in general. So a bit more on Newark. Uh, we mentioned the makeup of Newark, mostly Black and Latinx identified people. 30% of people are immigrants. Um, in the Ironbound specifically, 72% of all people are immigrants. We're going to move to the next. So uh, we mentioned sacrifice zone. Newark has a history um, of being a sacrifice zone. So a place where um, the needs of corporations um, is put far ahead of the safety of people, um, of whether it's their quality of life or their actual health, which we're gonna look at. Um, and it's been deemed a super fun site. So one of the top two most toxic sites um, in the United States. And this is due to a history of um, after World War II, where in World War II, there was the production of Agent Orange. Um, after this manufacturing uh, facility shut down and there was no longer a need to produce Agent Orange, all of the byproducts from Agent Orange um, were still a part of this site. Um, and one of those um, 
chemical or runoff chemical components is dioxin. Dioxin is known as a carcinogen, and so it can be cancer causing. Um, this site, uh, known as the Diamond Alkali Company, um, it was spaced or housed right on a 13 mile stretch of water that is not just in Newark and even expands to other communities um, with higher uh, like tax brackets, um, but nonetheless has dioxin to this day still running through it. Um, dioxin is hydrophobic. So that means that it doesn't mix with water. And so when we consider uh, climate crisis issues such as Hurricane Sandy, um, which also had some memes where people were saying it wasn't that serious. All it did was topple over my patio furniture. There are real impacts that people to this day have experienced. Um, and when we talk about just this micro community in New York, um, this community is at a lower sea level than a lot of other places in New York, meaning that when it rains really hard for a few minutes only, um, that the community and the streets flood. Um, to the point where you can Google images of people with jet skis on streets. Um, this is also a home to an immigrant detention center. This is also home to uh, what's known as chemical alleyway, pretty much. Um, in this community, there are homes, but there's also so many different factories, um, factories in which undocumented um, folks a lot of times work in have been documented to say that they've been locked into the factory um, by management so that they wouldn't leave. Um, and also a site there when in Hurricane Sandy, there was an actual hurricane that devastated um, this community. There were folks who were working in these factory sites um, of names that we know, such as HelloFresh, anything that really comes to mind. Um, who drowned on their way going back into their car once they were told that they can go home. Uh, so all this very heavy, and I want to apologize, but it is definitely a lot of story that isn't told um, about the community that I'm from, and I'm sure for a lot of you, stories that are devastating and hard to hear and hard to even talk about um, that are happening in our own communities. But um, going back to just this hydrophobic part, um, for people who are living in poverty, a lot of people may be living in illegal conversions. Um, so they may be sleeping in a basement, for example. Uh, having a cancer-causing chemical in a flood also means that walls get covered in this cancer-causing chemical. We can also consider that a lot of these people um, may not have the language justice. Um, so not just literally the translation, but sometimes when we speak in these heady academic terms, we're also keeping information from people. Um, so the access to information to know that there's harm, there's danger right in their space. Uh, because dioxin is a carcinogen, um, cancer is one of the outcomes of being exposed. Um, but another part is that, um, in my personal experience, I went to a high school where more than one person um, shared a story that they were a miracle child, that their uh, parent that gave birth to them had a miscarriage before they were born, at least one. And I thought it was so strange when I was in high school that more than one person would have that story. Now, as an adult um, going to work and only learning this information through work, uh, it's really sad to know that likely the causes of these miscarriages and a lot of health issues and health implications is due to uh, environmental racism. We're going to keep moving. So a bit more on diamond alkali. So besides it being cancer causing, it can include uh, a number of other um, consequences such as type two diabetes, uh, heart disease, uh, skin lesions, um, and can also cause what's considered developmental uh, issues in children. 
lead to reproductive and infertility, infertility issues in adults, result in miscarriages, damage the immune system, and interfere with hormones. A note that I would also like to bring into how we are more clearly seeing how this is uh, something that can be talked about in sex education um, is that this part that interferes with hormones. Um, it also took me a very long time and applying for scholarships and paying my own way to get to conferences and actually realizing that I wanted to be at the conferences where I saw black and brown people, um, where the speakers didn't have to use heady academic language, but instead I respect tremendously based off of their experience and the special things that they share. Uh, one of the bits of information that I received from a speaker um, from the Andes, uh, La Loba Loca, which I'll put in the chat and I'll write for myself so I don't forget or someone else can do it for me, um, shared or rather asked folks to share what is some abuelita or what is some, thank you, I see in the chat, what is some uh, indigenous knowledge about menstrual care? Um, and a lot of folks were sharing, you don't let your feet get cold. You keep um, your lower belly area very warm. In the chat, if folks feel moved or want to also share anything that they've heard, um, people were sharing a lot of that. So La Loba confirmed something that has come up in conversation at this point in my life, um, that a lot is not considered true or isn't really proven or isn't really real until it's expensive, until you have to pay to hear at a university. Um, so a lot of these gatekeeping spaces, when in fact, my mom has been telling me these things my whole life. Um, and my mom also is a conversation that isn't included. Um, even when we heard about the Me Too movement or we're hearing about it more and more, where her working as an undocumented person could not tell on a supervisor uh, who had been violent towards her because that meant that I wouldn't be able to eat. So we see that there's a lot of space, even when we talk about consent, um, because what consent is there when we are not fully informed as community members to what happens to the body? So we're gonna move. And I see in the chat, some folks are just sharing ancestral knowledge. Yes, for sure. Um, so I feel a lot of times when I see this, this one's not super necessary, but all to make a big point that uh, dioxins, uh, dioxin affects every vertebrae species at every stage of development, including the womb. So we're going to move to the next. The next image is another image from the beginning of this presentation from the protest uh, about lead contamination. So like Flint, Michigan, Newark uh, for several years has been experiencing a lead water crisis. Um, I know that there is another speaker who may have gone already um, during this uh, power shift conference by Clean Water for Newark. And they're doing a lot of work um, with this specifically. But uh, the infrastructure, the pipes underneath people's homes um, and community spaces were so old that they were leaking lead into the water. No level of lead contamination is safe for people to consume. The effects of lead um, can lead to nervous system damage, uh, impact growth and development, impact um, learning and behavior, impact hearing and speech. A lot of the folks who likely are the same people who have never heard of Agent Orange in the river, um, likely may not have heard that there was any reason to test for lead contamination in their water. Again, a reminder, this is less than three years ago. Like Flint, Michigan, uh, there is public relations groups that work to not talk about this. And like a lot of our communities who are facing these acts of violence towards the body, there is even more, although you're living in a space that's actually harmful to be in, this is a space that you are in and maybe have been in for generations. 
there is even still developers who will see a place like Newark who has a train station and an airport and water nearby, a port system that will still try to drive out people um, by not repairing uh, public housing sites, um, for example, as one, to actually displace hundreds of families. Um, this is the case currently, um, has been the case for several years in the East Ironbound. So I'm gonna connect folks if you wanna hear more information on the housing crisis. Um, but all this to say that even in luxury development that has come up, the folks in really expensive living that no one else in the community can live in still had the same lead pipes, but we're told because you live here, you don't have to worry about that. A lot of people were told you don't have to worry about this. It took uh, a lot of work to get a 17 second segment to broadcast on Univision to talk about lead water. A lot of times when people are concerned about the quality um, of their water, uh, they may go to boiling the water. But with lead, boiling water actually um, further concentrates lead. We're gonna move to the next image. This is an image taken by a local photographer. Um, this is a black adult holding a cart full of plastic water bottles. So similar to Masakane following in the footsteps of community care, um, during the height of the AIDS epidemic, or as it's known, funding for uh, community members in Newark, marginalized community members in Newark, uh, was funneled to suburbs for support programs for education, um, for medication access, for really all types of support um, for AIDS at the time. But in true Newark and communities like Newark fashion, the community comes together to help each other out. And what came out of that was sex education run by community in the spaces that made sense. So in the ballroom scene, um, in schools, how we're doing now in lots of places. But this is another example of community saying these pipes are not getting fixed fast enough. Um, not enough people know about this. So people started looking to how do we get water to people? Because it wasn't just water to, to drink directly. It was water people were using to brush the teeth of their children, water to bathe in, a fear of um, even now, uh, does my child, uh, have they had any of these things that you see on the slide? Has their um, IQ been affected, their ability to pay attention, their performance in school? Um, so this is something that folks are still concerned about and feels unclear. The reason why I chose this image is because the face of environmental justice work typically doesn't include plastic water bottles. It would include a swell bottle or whatever the trendy bottle is for people to lessen their consumption. Um, but this is the reality of what people had to do um, in order to deal with or survive the experience at hand. We're going to move to the next. So I'm gonna check the time too so that I know, okay. So we have a bit of time left and I do want to hear more from folks. Um, but we're going to take this into what do we get from this info so far? Uh, what can we tangibly take with us um, in the spaces that we talk to other people to, whether it's work or not? Um, I, in the description, said that sex education, this is a space for, yes, people who are interested in sex education, reproductive justice, um, but know that Every place in which we work where we're going to be talking to people, sex education and reproductive justice is going to be a part of those interactions. Um, everyone we talk to, we don't know what experiences we, they've gone through. And um, I think it's really in our kindest interest to be conscious of um, the stories that are less told. So we're going to move to our next image. We talked about pollution in a few different ways, but just to really drive a point of this image we can think of when I talk about Newark. 
Um, besides air pollution from an incinerator, from tons of factories, from uh, giant trucks who are in and out every single day on roads that are not meant for trucks and damaging the roads and idling in front of schools and homes where children and people already have asthma. The air pollution also comes from uh, the airport actually being so close to the East Ironbound, this micro neighborhood facing the most environmental impact, um, flying so close and so often that literally your conversation will be interrupted every two and a half minutes. So we saw that lead can cause um, effects in people's ability to um, participate and have a successful academic experience, um, but also imagine being interrupted every two and a half minutes. The water is so toxic um, that I mentioned Hurricane Sandy where there was flooding um, and that this community floods a lot. I also mentioned that this 13 mile stretch of body of water um, is not just in Newark, it's in other communities too. So um, one of the documented cases uh, resulting from Sandy was actually um, a time later after Sandy occurred where there was a heavy rain and some flooding again, where a little league team, so a team of young people who play sports, um, were still playing during um, a muddy uh, space that they were in or in a muddy space. Um, and a lot of these young people um, actually were diagnosed with cancer. What is to say like what happens after that? Um, people had settlements in court, um, but I also mentioned that the toxic um, violence that happens also is known to impact um, people's ability to carry healthy pregnancies. Um, if myself going to high school and not hearing about this information um, is in my experience, I also know that the non-English speakers um, have not had access to this information. I also know that people who have experienced multiple miscarriages um, and maybe also have been diagnosed with cancer do not know that they qualify for assistance at a local hospital if and only if they have two miscarriages and are diagnosed with cancer. One more thing I want to mention with that is that um, I mentioned La Loba Loca and I mentioned um, ancestral knowledge, but one other thing that isn't necessarily ancestral knowledge, but we can feel in our bodies as experts of our bodies of knowing what's up is that um, people who live, people with uteruses who live close to um, environmental racism perpetrators, um, so factories, um, examples like that may have a more painful menstruation than people who don't. Um, and who lives the closest to uh, these actors of environmental racism um, are black and brown people. So we'll talk about that just a bit more coming up. Um, and one more thing about the soil. The soil is so toxic as you can imagine from the water that Gardening and fishing is something that a lot of people still do. Um, and why would they not be able to do? But the condition is so toxic that growing your own vegetables is risky. Um, and so what's been done by community organizations is growing above ground on concrete um, for safe growing. Um, and signs that are in the predominant languages in the iron bound of Spanish and Portuguese that say no fishing, but people still do. We're going to move to the next. So I mentioned menstruation. Um, if we look even maybe not deeper, but just on another side of the intersections where everything uh, works together, people of color and economically challenged communities have even more difficult barriers when it comes to accessing health care due to the historic practice of racism in OBGYN practices. Pelvic pain and pain in general is perceived as tolerable by people of color, or at the very least inconsequential. While the same pelvic pain is marketed as a white woman's disease or a career woman's disease. So now knowing that menstruation uh, is more painful when you live near environmental racism, 
when even just conversations about sexuality are often made taboo? Um, how do people whose pain is discounted, uh, not taken seriously, or maybe don't even really have access to healthcare, um, really talk about that experience? Um, how do we deal with pain? Um, speaking as someone who uh, has a uterus, talk about this pain um, when I am or have been made to be embarrassed or try to erase who I am as someone who has indigenous history, indigenous practice, including sobadas or massaging of the womb space for not just the spirit, but also for um, menstruation care. So all this just also because um, I hope that folks also, if at, at this point in our lives have not um, tried to really pull apart um, the, the identity um, issues that a lot of times we're given where things are not real because they're not um, white and expensive, that there is definitely knowledge. Um, there's knowledge in understanding fractions because we know how to make a braid. So all this, just to keep validating, keep um, talking about it in this way. We're gonna to move to the next. This is one of the most recent um, things that come out of 2020 only, but I'm sure there's more coming out that showed up in the New York Times. Um, and the headline was climate change tied to pregnancy risks affecting black, mother black mothers most. Women or people with uteruses exposed to high temperatures or air pollution are more likely to have premature underweight or stillborn babies. So air pollution, we already described this community. We already described all the factors that are impacting people's um, safe and sustainable opportunity of life. Um, so without trees, um, it's very likely that there's a hotter area. Um, there's actually a documented hotter temperature in this concrete place where people are still paying rent during a pandemic, still facing eviction um, because they may be undocumented or uninformed um, about the, the laws and policies that protect people during a pandemic um, and are still being displaced. Um, so yes, there's a lot going on in the body, but I want folks to realize also, um, or maybe put together, if it makes sense to you, because I don't want anyone to do anything that doesn't make sense to you, um, know that even issues like housing justice are related to this concept of reproductive justice if we're thinking about safe and sustainable. Um, I know someone in the chat mentioned period poverty. So yes, um, people's space to be able to feel the body, um, to be able to hear the body, listen to the body um, without all of these other factors, um, which may be pain related, may be stress related, may be fear related. Um, it would be far too easy for sex education to be something where we talk about pressing buttons that equal pleasure um, without uh, talking about how a concept like consent is not something that's um, readily available and given to communities who are facing all of these things, um, which we don't even know are happening, or we're saying that our pain is just something that happens, um, or something we don't talk about, or we're silently um, struggling with outcomes that affect uh, birth outcomes, report cards coming back, um, all the things. Um, it's not that I blinked exactly, it's that I feel like it's a lot, um, but I tie it with this, that yes, literally reproductive issues with environmental racism, um, but all the ways in which we're not given a safe place to be with ourselves and hear ourselves um, are dangerous places, in my opinion. We're going to move to the next. So I here have just a few more places and spaces to plug in. Um, one is a documentary made about the East Ironbound as a sacrifice zone. So the sacrifice zone.org for seeing if there are screenings available. 
on YouTube, there's the Mothers of Terrell Homes. So one more um, anecdote, Terrell Homes is a public housing space. And even with environmentalism, when we think about displacement and gentrification, um, bike paths are something that would be great for the environment and sound wonderful in community. I am a biker and sometimes they might feel safer, but in practice, they don't actually, for me at least. Um, and parks seem like something that's moving forward and that tote bag. But what happened after fighting for and getting a beautiful riverfront park in this community is that developers now see this beautiful park and have their eye on public housing, which is right next to the park. Public housing that is in the same community of people who are still paying for rent in places that are harming their bodies and the bodies of their loved ones. And so Terrell Homes is to this day still fighting uh, demolition. Um, the community members and generations that have lived there are facing displacement. Um, and there is a video on YouTube to give a bit more information on it. On social medias, there is Compassionate NJ, which is a conversation and um, actions that people can take to support um, the housing crisis during a pandemic. Uh, Masakane is just a reminder of, if anyone is interested now that we're virtual on becoming a sex educator um, and working to fund, especially a QT BIPOC. Um, Newark Community Pantry is my own, but also a collective effort with folks to get food to people, but also including uh, menstrual care um, items and gender affirming products to community. And this one just came to mind while I was adding the resources to this. Safe Not Safe is a conversation um, that I'll be working with in the near future, but is a really interesting project um, on indigenous community talking about places that someone feels safe and places that someone does not feel safe. And I'll leave it at that if you're interested in seeing more of it. Um, all this sad, bad news to know that at least there's community at the end of the day. Um, one of the most beautiful things about the community that, that, the community that I come from are um, the people that I know, the people that are always holding each other, the humor that comes from all the BS that people have to experience. Um, and just how even at the constant threat of gentrification and displacement and buildings that are huge and don't fit in the community and look like a giant middle finger, um, that the community is beautiful and has a history. Um, so my little plug and my little heart for Newark. We're going to move to the last slide, and I hope I gave us enough time just for any feelings. Um, this in Quechua, Yupaychani, means thank you so much. Um, my email is there in case anything, um, and my Instagram. Uh, lately, it's just been memes. Um, but you can see events also are speaking stuff. So with that, I wanted to exit screen and see some of the chat. And I invite people to come off mic and share any feelings, share anything that came up, share um, maybe something that resonated with you, if you'd like. I see a heart and I thank you. Um, while I'm looking through the chat, I invite anybody to come off mic if you'd like, share anything. Thank you so much for sharing this space. Um, I really hope that these are some things that we can take into fields like social work, to know that even in sex education, this is coming from an expensive white textbook um, and is not including the experiences um, that people are facing and the people who are really deeply impacted in so many different ways. Um, I had something that came to mind. Um, my cousins live in a very rich part of Wisconsin, very, very rich neighborhood in Wisconsin, um, but not too far from them is a community quite like um, Newark, like you described, 
um, that they didn't even know about and we had to drive through to get to them and they had never been and I was like asking questions about it. Um, but the community that they that my aunt and my mom grew up in um, was a small like farming community and there were a lot of uh, toxic waste sites super fun in Indiana that aren't taken care of still. Um, so, you know, they've had a, a lot of issues in our family with, um, yeah, being able to have kids and miscarriages. And I just like, I <laughs> got me thinking of, of those sites aren't really talked about in the same way um, because it's a lot, I think it's a lot less people and it's a lot more spread out, but um, that it just, it's, it's odd how it reaches so far um, that, that even though they're in a rich community now <laughs> that is so protected within their own little bubble, um, they're still living with it regardless. But it's, yeah, it's not talked about at all. So thank you for today though. Thank you so much for sharing, Josie. Um, while folks are still here, I do see a question and I did want to, because I, I told you all, I warned you, I'll keep going if I can. So one of the things I just wanna bring in from this other community that I live in, in my head and sometimes physically um, in Ecuador, in the Amazon, um, I now also look at gentrification and displacement in a way that became so real from this um, community. And it is just an anecdote. And I do want to get to this question as well. Two questions. So I'll hurry this up. Um, is that for people to create um, the roof of their homes, there is a natural material referred to as paja. Um, paja is very affordable because it's just a way of life. Um, because developers like developers that take an eye and see where can we completely ignore the safety of people and just kick them out and create homelessness. Um, the same happens globally. So even during the pandemic, even during this meme of nature is healing, um, oil spills in the Amazon, uh, developers and luxury spaces built up in the Amazon and globally. Um, but also just this anecdote on Baja, that material that creates the roof, um, becoming multiple, so many times more expensive that community members can no longer afford to create the roofs of their homes um, because the luxury spaces now want to have a cute aesthetic. Just that. I see. Do you have advice for someone wanting to grow as a reproductive ally? Thank you so much for that question. I want to offer it out also to the group because although I've been sharing a lot of information, we all have so much information. So if anyone has any places they want to plug in the chat or any thoughts that come to mind, I think that would be great to also add. Becoming a reproductive ally. Um, I want to say we do a lot of listening. Um, I want to think uh, that there are organizations that even within the organization, we're checking um, who is given the opportunity to be speaking. And so I think what I consider being an ally is knowing when I can take or should take a step back and be like, I'm not the person for this. I shouldn't be talking about this. Um, so all this, because I mentioned it in the beginning, I have the privilege of being here, but I know there's been so much work and resources and fighting long before me, not coming from all the privileges that I come from. Um, what is the best way to go about getting involved with sex education training with Masakane? Awesome. So the website is great. There is um, every semester or every kind of like season, because I'm in Jersey, um, there is an opportunity for people to come in as a sex educator or learn about grant writing or social media, whatever it is. Um, and opportunities for payment because this is a donation-based organization. Um, our folks sometimes do it as like their internship, but we understand that that's not accessible for everyone, especially um, marginalized folks. So there's also stipends available um, for people of marginalized identities. So I would say go on the website, um, send an email, let them know you came to my conversation and it made you think about it. So that'd be great. Any other questions, any feelings, any takeaway? Um, I know that even before doing this conversation, things feel heavy. So if at the end of this, you feel heavy, just a reminder, um, we have every right to just listen to ourselves. Even when we're so excited about so much information like we do at conferences, please 
take care of yourself if you need to take a break know that hopefully the information will be there to come back to and many many thanks to folks out here thank you i will stick around for any other questions or anything that folks want to share once again thank you so much um this is great i love having the opportunity to talk about this